Thanks for joining us for today's webinar, uh, Hiring Insights Using Data to Navigate the Permanently Changed Recruitment Landscape. My name is Daniel Mintz. I'm the Chief Data Evangelist here at Looker. I'll be your host and moderator for today's presentation. And you know we're going to get started in just a second, but before we do, I just want to go over a few quick housekeeping items. Uh, we'll have a 15-minute question and answer session at the end of our presentation. But if you do have a question at any time during the presentation for any of our presenters, please just type it in the Q&A box you see and click send, and we'll pick those up at the end of the presentation. As I've said, the presentation is being recorded, and we'll send out the recording to you by email after it's over. So don't worry if you need to drop off or have missed any part of it, uh, you will be able to watch it later. One last thing, the windows you see on your screen are all customizable. Uh, so that means you can minimize them, maximize them, move them around however you see fit. If you accidentally minimize or close a window, don't worry, just click the toolbar menu on the bottom of your screen to bring it back up. And with that, let's get to our content. So uh, as I said again, uh, my name is Daniel Mintz. I'm Looker's chief data evangelist. We're part of Google Cloud. Um, and you know, we, as our technical difficulties uh, provide proof, we are living in unusual times uh, with new requirements and new things that we need to figure out. Um, and you know, unprecedented times call for good data. You know, if you're somebody who's been in your business for a long time, you probably have strong intuitions, strong gut feelings about how things are going to go, and you can rely on those pretty darn well uh, to figure out how things are going to go. You know, if you're somebody who's been managing a supermarket in the U.S. for many years, you probably don't need a ton of data to figure out what you should order coming up on the July 4th holiday. You know that you need to order more hamburgers and more charcoal because you know that that's what people are going to buy. You don't need great data to tell you that because your gut, your intuition knows that. But if you're living in today's times where, you know, the world is changing faster than I can ever remember it uh, changing and it's changing you know, from day to day, from week to week, from month to month, you need data to tell you what's happening, what just happened, you know, what's what's going to happen. Um, I thought a great example of that was looking at Google's community mobility report data. Um, so what you're looking at there is the comparison to baseline of how much people in the U.S. are going into their workplace. Uh, so you can see at the beginning uh, in February. You know, it's right around 0%, which is to say right around baseline. And then in mid-March, just falls off a cliff. You know, people stopped going into their workplaces. Some of them, that was because they were working from home. Some of them, unfortunately, that's because they were laid off or furloughed. Their workplace might have closed. And, you know, we're now looking at 50-ish percent less uh, attendance to workplaces than we were. But it's starting to climb again. You know, you can see that seasonality still matters. You can see that May 25th, um, you know, right around Memorial Day, people did not go into work, uh, not surprisingly. But, you know, the bigger trend is pretty clear that people are not going to work like they used to. And so if you want to really understand, you know, how much are people coming to retail shops? How much are people going to the grocery store? You need data to tell you that. And, you know, that's where Looker comes in, you know, We've been t working with customers across every industry you can imagine, and they've been using Looker to try to grapple with the new challenges that this environment poses, because they know that they need to adapt to this environment, because if they don't use data to adapt to this environment, they know that their business might not make it. And you know, when, when they think about how to use Looker, I think it's important to just think about the few things that really sets Looker apart from other tools that people might be using to look at data. First off, it's fast on any data size um, because it's sitting directly on top of the most powerful databases uh, that exist today, whether that's something like Google BigQuery or Amazon Redshift or Snowflake. You know, you can leverage all of the power of those tools, leaving your data in place and querying it right in place. Second is that Looker centralizes all of the knowledge that your analyst team about has about what your data means in one place so that anybody in the business can ask questions of that data and know that they're getting trusted, reliable answers. It gives you a single source of truth. Third is that Looker is built for modern developers. So you know all of the things that developers have, have learned about building powerful, complex systems, those are baked into Looker. So you know things like version control, things like development, staging, and production, things like 
uh, full API coverage, all of those are built right into Looker. And finally, you know, Looker gives you the data where and when you need it. Because we know that if you require people to come to you to get data, some of them will, but lots of them won't. Right? That's just too much uh, you know, friction, too, too intimidating to learn a new tool. And so they'll just make those decisions using their gut because they can't access the data that they would like to access, you know, knowing that they could make better decisions with that data. Whereas you know, if you use something like Looker to push data into the places that they're already working, that's where you can uh, really see amazing adoption across the organization. And so, you know, I'm really excited today. Um, we have three really great guests. We've got Baron Roff, who's the co-founder and CEO of Harvard, as well as Greg DeTulio, who's the vice president of delivery and customer success at Harvard. They're going to talk about how they're helping organizations navigate this incredibly quickly changing hiring landscape by adding insights powered by Looker to provide end-to-end -end visibility into you know recruitment performance. Um, and they're gonna we're gonna follow up with a fireside chat with Teddy Liao, who's the CEO of Nextrep, and he's gonna walk us through an amazing case that showcases you know what a talent acquisition department and really a whole organization are capable of when digital transformation is done right. So with that, I'm going to hand it off to Baron, who's going to talk about what uh, Harvard is doing in this quickly changing new environment. Take it away, Baron. Hey, thank you so much, Daniel. Thanks for the great introduction. And, and let's see how your story applies to recruitment. So two big events are bringing society to a new reality. Events that uh, shape the world we live in today and the ones we will live in tomorrow. The first one, obviously, you already mentioned it, is this COVID-19. It brought the world to a halt and caused unemployment rates that succeeded those of the Great Depression. People even talk about the biggest crisis since World War II, and now we're still in the middle of it all, so much even that we don't yet fully understand the economic effects on the long run. But we do know that they will be severe. And then a second movement. It started by global Black Lives Matter protests. And it's pushing society forward and trying to finally bring justice to minority groups. And these protests are making it ever more clear that racism is still widely embedded in many parts of our society and that we have to actively pursue ways to eradicate it from all our systems. And these two waves of change impact all our parts of our life. And they fuel four major trends in talent acquisition that, if we fail to act, can define the future of any organization in a very negative way. And I want to start by sharing those four trends with you. So the first one is extreme unemployment. In May this year in the US, we had about 36 million unemployed people. And all these people are looking for new jobs. So we can expect that applicant volume will spike significantly. And on top of that, people from affected industries are forced to look elsewhere. And they will try to enter, enter industries they have never worked in before. This can literally flood recruitment teams. And then the second trend, cost saving. We had a decade of abundance, but the crisis that is ahead of us will be unlike anything we've seen before, and it will result in budget cuts across the board. To put it simple, for TA, TA needs to handle more applicants with less budget. And it's going to be even harder. Because I think the most significant one, trend number three, removing all bias everywhere. I think finding and finding bias has always been on the mind of talent acquisition leaders. But from now on, the world is looking over our shoulders. It only takes one misconduct from one recruiter and it will demolish an employer brand overnight. So you can expect that unbiased recruitment will be priority number one. And lastly, number four, volatility. Around the globe, we're slowly starting the economy again, so the hiring machine is on again as well. But we know that if a second spike happens and tomorrow the government decides we all have to yeah, move back inside, then we're back to square one. So that means that the need for controlled agility has never been greater. And agility comes through information. And that information needs to be accurate, up to date. And as just mentioned by Daniel, it has to be available anytime. So if you summarize those four trends, it means that we need to handle large applicant volumes coming from different industries while assuring an unbiased process 
doing that in a volatile job market with less budget. This is the reality every TA leader of a large organization is facing the coming years. And that's why many talent acquisition leaders are moving towards a new reality. A reality, a reality that is digital and that is fair. And if you think about it, it's not only talent acquisition leaders that are shifting focus. Digital and fair will be topics on the board of every organization. So let's zoom in a little bit. What do we mean by digital and fair? And what does it especially mean when it comes to recruitment? I think if you go 10 years back in time, companies thought that having an ATS was digital. But it's so much more. It's, when, when you talk digital tomorrow, it means a digital application from apply to hire with data-driven decisions on every step of the way. It also means integrating all technology to create one seamless experience with the least amount of touch points and a maximum level of agility and transparency. So that's digital. But what do we mean then with FAIR? So it for sure is more than just collecting EEOC data. You do that just to be yeah, legally defensible. It's also much more than an awareness course or, or using an assessment. FAIR means ensuring that every part of the recruitment process is free of any bias and monitoring that every step of the way continuously. It's taking it to a whole new level. And why is digital and FAIR the way forward? Simple. A digital and FAIR hiring process allows you to handle the four trends that the coming years will define the world of recruitment. So, our industry is on a journey towards digital transformation and towards fairness. But how to navigate? How to navigate through digital transformation in pursuit of fundamental fairness? I think this is the question we all want to answer today. And to answer that question, we will first briefly uh, look at three building blocks that many forward-thinking companies have implemented or are implementing right now to transform their recruitment operation. These are matching technology, automation, and experience. And then we will look at the fourth circle. We will look at the navigating part of our question. A digital process is controlled by data. And together with Google Looker, we shaped a new reality when it comes to steering talent acquisition. We will showcase this new level of business intelligence with real life examples. But let's start with the first three, three and let's start with matching technology. So in the whole story that I just explained, why should you use matching technology? It's pretty simple. Humans are inherently biased. Talent acquisition leaders that still deny this, they, they warp their teams back to the last century. Future-proof recruitment teams they want scientifically validated data that helps recruiters in fair decision making. And matching technology is not a static solution. It comes again to data because it should be continuously validated. So it will never create adverse impact. And actually, evenly important, it will always be predictive for on the job success. And when it comes to this new reality, the old generic adverse impact studies, they won't do the job anymore. But matching technology brings more than fair decision-making. Matching technology also enables fast decision-making. It no longer depends on a recruiter opening a laptop. Scheduling for an interview, for example, can happen on Saturday night at 4 a.m. It can happen any moment and any time if you have good matching technology. And why is that? Well, if your matching technology is on point, it allows you to automate your recruitment workflows. Because if you zoom in and you look at the workload of a recruiter, the vast majority is often repetitive and it's laborious. It's CV screening, it's having intake calls, it's scheduling appointments, it's sending email. And to bring it all together, it's costly and it's very ineffective. So automation will take this over so your team can focus on the human part of the job. Automate, automation makes your process extremely fast. Decision making in seconds instead of days. And that will contribute hugely to the applicant experience, the third circle. Applicant experience, especially in times of crisis, and especially when the volume of applicant is going up, you want to treat your applicants as your best customers. 
because applicant volume will spike and you will be forced to give them the best experience. So you will have to do that in a digital way. And it must be positive, even if the result is a rejection. And in this strong application journey, selling and selecting should merge. Applying should also excite your applicants. But in a new reality, the journey must also be informative and transparent on the opportunity at hand. Because as mentioned, applicants will be forced to move industries and they must get a realistic job review to allow them also to, you know, to self-select. And it should also be a dialogue where the applicant can give honest feedback. Applying must be a two-way communication, always, also when there is high volume. So we've been talking about matching. We've been talking about automation, about experiments. How, how does this all come together? How does this work in the real world? world? Well, before diving into the main topic, the business intelligence together with Looker, I will show you a short movie of an example of an end-to-end -end digital application experience process. Imagine a reality where your applicants all go through the same application process after clicking the apply button. This immersive experience does not only showcase your brand and values, it also excites them for the job. Welcome to the takeoff, the first step in your application for the international graduate program at Heineken. My name is Nikki and I am here to guide you through this takeoff. Before we we'll start, I'll have to check you in. Let me know who you are. In this experience, everyone that is applying will be treated fair and equally. While the applicant is taking various tests, the Harvard platform collects all relevant data to predict on-the-job success. And this can vary from cognitive skills, personality traits, job knowledge, but also simple knockout criteria. In partnership with our People Science team, we'll build a custom matching framework. This framework is designed to generate output that is in line with the core requirements of the job you are hiring for. Candidates can be matched to a specific skill, but also to organizational values. But hey, this is what it's all about. After completing the journey, we'll provide personal insights to every single applicant. We'll ask them to share how they experience the application, so we are able to optimize the experience if needed. All relevant candidate data will be summarized in a digestible overview for recruiters and hiring managers. In this overview, we'll only show data that is meaningful to you and your organization. And most importantly, you don't have to be an IO psychologist to understand it. And this is crucial for the adoption and change management process. Naturally, the most important data will be pushed to your ATS system. From there, the Harvard platform can trigger business rules for automation to speed up your workflows and to minimize manual efforts. Yeah, in the end, we talked about the ATS system and, and later we will talk about data. And as we know, the ATS system is often the heartbeat of a recruitment organization. So all the data that we collect and match indicators we produce are sent to the ATS. But in digital transformation, it, it should be so much more you should take it one step further. And, and that's what Harvard did. Our platform can operate the ATS, the ATS. So it's not only sending data, it's scheduling interviews, communicating with applicants, shortlisting top applicants. And of course, everything is fast and bias free. And this, what you just saw, is exactly what we've been offering to our clients over the past years. Matching technology, automation, and a great candidate experience, all wrapped up into one platform, fast, fair, and data driven. But while doing this, we produced and we collected millions of data points that can really help to steer an organization when it goes through transition or in general operation. But for this data to be meaningful, it needs to be structured and presented in actionable insights. You need to combine all data from all different sources and transform it into real-time navigation tools, the navigation we were looking for when we asked a question. And that's the reason we teamed up with Google Looker. And that's the data revolution we will present today. So now it's my pleasure to welcome my colleague, Craig DiTulio. He's our VP of Delivery and Customer Success. He will present the fourth circle. It's called Business Intelligence. And um, I'll see you afterwards, you in the Q&A. But for now, uh, welcome, Greg, and the floor is yours. 
Thank you so much, Baron. So as Baron just covered, we believe that the answer is business intelligence, the fourth building block of a successful digital transformation. So if you've made it onto this webinar, you already understand the importance of data. But what you may not yet know is how business intelligence becomes the most critically important tool in your belt once you've operationalized your transformation at scale, harnessing your ability to measure outcomes, relationships, and identifying where the calls to action exist in real time. Now, the challenge is that for most companies, business intelligence is a transformation afterthought as opposed to a day one consideration. To complicate matters, enterprise recruitment tech stacks have become increasingly decentralized, resembling a web of purpose-built tools for each individual component of the hiring process. Now, as you can imagine, this has created enterprise-sized data roadblocks for companies when conducting cross-platform analysis in an attempt to harness the power of their transformation and establish operational grip on what's happening, where, why, and how outcomes can drive strategy decisions for the top of the funnel. So I'm sure many of you, or for many of you, this is a highly relatable challenge. And that's because pretty much every application in the stack is designed to exclusively report on the data that it generates by itself. But what we know is that the data created by digital transformations, uh, notably the matching results, the automated decision points, uh, and the experience data that platforms like Harvard creates is the most is most valuable to an organization when it's married with the context of your advertising activities from sourcing platforms and CRMs and the stage progression events or hiring decisions that are originating in adjacent platforms within the stack. So to bridge this gap, we launched an enterprise self-service analytics suite within Harvard called Insights, uh, which is powered by Looker on the Google Cloud. As Barnd explained, Harvard's matching technology is a data-driven product. So when we developed our business intelligence suite, we knew that it had to be equally as powerful and flexible as our own product, while providing the same look and feel to end users. And we had intentionally designed insights, as you heard before, as the layer to bridge our customers' common data gaps that exist across the applications in the funnel, while also providing an incredibly rich analytics experience for Harvard's native matching and automation capabilities. So the real magic happens when these two worlds collide. Within Insights, we accomplish this essentially master layer review by ingesting and classifying data from the disparate systems within your stack. Uh, examples include source UTMs from job applications and social media listings to the hiring decisions returned to Harbor from webhooks via your ATS's APIs. Pretty complicated stuff. So for customers to get started, we knew that we had to develop a curated library of off-the-shelf dashboards that answer the most pressing topics in digital recruitment and selection, in addition to providing our enterprise customers with self-service access to really their own client-specific data model for DIY dashboarding, scheduling, exporting, and of course, configuring those trigger-based alerts so that, as Daniel mentioned, that data can be pushed to you as a data consumer. For this, we developed 10, well, actually more than 10 off-the-shelf visualizations that are powered by uh, a little over 100 individual metrics that are designed to tell the complete story, uh, all of the supporting angles, and also include an extensive suite of configurable filters, because we know that everyone really needs to slice and dice the data across all the key dimensions of their business um, without imposing any historical limits on uh, archive data. So we can go back as far as we want in time and filter it by the factors that matter most now, as we know that's a constant evolution. Behind the scenes, Google's powered by look or the powered by Looker capability uh, from Google Cloud is essentially what's doing all the heavy lifting, um, while also protecting our customers' data through a multi-tenancy architecture and a intentional data residency and anonymization rule set for strict GDPR compliance. So now that you understand the how and why, um, let's take a look at four of the Harbor Insights standard dashboards in the context of burning questions that every single high volume, high velocity organization was challenged with over the course of the past three months. We're gonna start on the topic of sourcing. Uh, 
likely a painful topic for many of you when you get your monthly invoices uh, from the various sourcing platforms out there. Which recruitment sources are yielding the highest quality candidates? Um, seems like a, a simple question, uh, but the reality is sourcing is super expensive. And companies are traditionally focusing their spend and outreach tactics on sources that yielded the highest historical conversion rates. And with rapid change in labor markets and unemployment globally over the course of the past three months, um, firms woke up and realized that historical outcomes are not an effective basis for decision making in the current reality. So through digital transformation, best fit candidates can be identified at the top of funnel real time and harnessed by using real-time insights. So we developed sourcing insights to answer some of these key questions. What are our overall source distributions? What is my stage conversion and my hiring rate by recruitment source? In real time, can I identify the match quality at the top of the funnel by source? And can I A-B test candidate pools spanning social to traditional job boards before making a large investment in spend if I need to fill a lot of seats fast? Lastly, by source, can I identify the best platform to engage the public? Are your quality candidates applying at home, on the laptop, or from a mobile device or tablet? Pretty cool, right? So next up, let's shift to a operational topic. Uh, is my team in control of funnel performance? And as Barron laid out some of this context, I think we all know that the last three months were unlike anything we've ever seen before. Uh, unemployment rates at record highs, forcing job transitions, uh, essential worker scaling, uh, work from home became a thing, uh, BPOs and gig economy organizations had to scale overnight. And now, uh, fortunately, businesses are shifting to reopening strategies for non-essential businesses that are driving app volumes like you have absolutely never seen before. Meanwhile, your recruitment team sizes have not changed. If anything, they've shrunk. So for this, we've released Time to Action Insights, which provides you with end-to-end -end hiring performance. Is your funnel performance changing with volume as app volumes increase? Is my team slower to respond? Are they slower to hire? Let's drill down into the components of the hiring process. At a step level, which step from a root cause perspective is driving the change in time to hire? When did that change occur and where? Here, we display both aggregate trends with the ability to drill down to the ground floor to identify best and worst locations, where uncharacteristic changes are occurring, whether that's a division, location, or even a requisition level. So let's shift to one of the third building blocks of digital transformation, which is experience. Are my highest quality candidates raving fans of my digitally transformed process? And for those of you who have not yet gone through a digital transformation, you should know that digital does not mean impersonal. The candidate's first opportunity to provide feedback should also not have to wait until a hiring decision is made. The opportunity to provide feedback should be early in the process where you interact with the most candidates by volume so that you can capture the truest sentiment of how people are perceiving your organization and the process you've developed. The reality, though, is that businesses need an easy way to be proactive and keep tabs on what people have to say about the process with trending sentiments real time before you find that negative feedback posted on a social platform. So through experience insights, you can keep a pulse on the experience real time and where it matters most. So for example, are my top performing matches that I want to attract providing positive or negative feedback? Are the people I want to hire, are they engaged with what I've done? does the length of my digital process have an impact on the candidate's experience with it? And what are candidates saying right now? Get down to the ground level, from real-time scrolling feeds to sentiment-based word cloud analysis with drill downs into actual commentary and word-by-word -word sentences provided by the people who are going through your process. For our last example, we're going to dive into an incredibly important topic bias insights. How inclusive are our hiring processes? So as Barron covered earlier, hiring should be digital and hiring should be fair. Inequalities in the hiring process are often the result of small steps of conscious and unconscious bias along the way. As an example, 
we all know that an individual's name can impact their chances of being selected for an interview in a traditional recruitment process. And traditional recruitment processes, well, they're, they're largely based on name and resume alone. So that creates a huge problem. We believe that eliminating bias in the recruitment process is equally an individual responsibility and an organizational responsibility. And the reality that we're waking up to is that most firms are not equipped with the controls to operationalize and monitor fair hiring processes at scale or to proactively identify areas where bias may exist and require immediate attention. So for this, we developed bias insights so that organize, organizations can identify in aggregate, are there flags indicating potential name-based or gender-based hiring biases? Are there factors that are changing over time as I take corrective actions with my team? And big picture, are there less qualified candidates being selected for stage progression over higher performing candidates of a certain minority or gender based on reported EEOC data? With Bias Insights, we unlock this capability and give organizations the power to have grip and control at the top of the funnel of their process and not have to wait to take action. So now that you have a glimpse of how a digitally transformed process harnessed by the power of business intelligence enables your hiring program to be future-proof, I'd like to introduce you to our partner, NextRep, and CEO, Teddy Liao, to learn how their modernized selection program enabled them to pivot their business at tremendous scale in a critical time of need, providing essential services to those impacted by COVID-19. And I'll say, uh, working with Teddy and his team has been an amazing journey. They've done some really incredible stuff the moment that COVID hit. And this is a story that is absolutely worth hearing. Uh, Daniel, Teddy, over to you. Thanks so much, Greg, thanks, and Greg. thanks, Baron. Um, and yeah, so Teddy, before I've got some questions uh, for you about your story, because I, I know it's a pretty amazing one. Um, but before I do, I'd love for you to give us a little bit of of a sense of sort of, you know, what NextRep does and, you know, how you've pivoted to to react to the, you know, incredible as somebody who's here in New York City, I can I can say from lived experience, the really dire situation that that we all faced here in New York. Yeah, NextRep is uh, the largest at home BPO. So we're an outsourced contact center. Uh, with all of our agents in the United States. So we have agent, thousands of agents in 42 states, um, which makes us uh, the outsourced BPO that has the largest footprint in America. So home forever, <laughs> well before uh, COVID. And obviously when COVID hit, um, it, it was a great opportunity for us to kind of show how important it is to do what we do. Um, and uh, the need has been uh, astronomical. The growth has been astronomical. And it's just great to be able to, to do a couple things. One is to provide an instantaneous solution to our clients that we service, but more than anything, provide these work opportunities for the thousands or millions of people that actually need work. Um, so, so that's NextRep in a, in a nutshell. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, that is good, good feedback. So, okay. So you didn't have to change where you were working from. That's good. Uh, that's one change you didn't have to make, but you know, you did uh, sort of digitally transform your hiring process, right? Um, you know, to to grapple with the volume that was that was brand new. And I'm curious to hear sort of what drove you to do that. Yeah, I mean, if you if you think about if everybody on this phone call just kind of thinks about how many open recs do you have right now? So how many people are you looking to hire? All right, everybody have that number. If you kind of think about, well, how many applications do you need to bring in in order to fill those? We used to get before COVID 2000 applications a week. A week, every single week, about 2,000 applications. So uh, from a, a process standpoint, to, to really be able to navigate through all the applications and make sure that we're fair, make sure that we're getting the highest quality, um, it, it's always been a challenge for us. Now, after COVID came, that number skyrocketed from 2,000 to 7,000 applications a week. <laughs> so as hard as it was to navigate through 2,000, uh, we're talking about almost a 4x, uh, 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 you know, growth. And, and that was done within a week, right? So it was it was unbelievable. Now, that that's just on the application side. What about on the need side, right, on the demand side? On the demand side, we've actually grown and added over 4,000 workers to our platform since COVID started, right? So 4,000 in, in a traditional call center 
environment. It's usually about a five to one uh, ratio in terms of number of people that you apply, uh, people that uh, apply to the number and interview to the number of people that you need. So in a normal brick and mortar facility, they would have needed uh, fill that with 20,000 interviews and applications. So we, we've obviously well surpassed that. Um, but some of the stories that we've been able to help out with are, are pretty amazing. So uh, we've been able to help out with uh, Teladoc, which is the number one telemedicine company. So we were able to add several hundred agents within about four weeks for Teladoc. Um, the, another example was, everybody knows, but I'm not allowed to say their name, but the largest grocery delivery company, we're able to add 1,200 folks onto that, that platform. Uh, for customer service agents. Um, and one of the really cool, and we did that in about three and a half weeks. So about a thousand people, right? Over a thousand people on that. And, uh, you know, for, for, for Daniel, because you live in New York, um, New York State, if you remember, was one of the first states to do drive through COVID testing, right? So you drive through in your car, you do the nose swab, you move on to your business. So uh, they figured out how to do the testing. They figured out the locations. They figured out all the staff that was actually going to conduct the drive-through testing, and they forgot about the call center. <laughs> so, literally within four days, we were able to get 150 of next reps appointment setters for this COVID, uh, uh, you know, drive-through COVID testing. So, you know, four days, 150 people, you know, three, uh, two and a half months, 4,000 people. And uh, it really wasn't an option. We, we, out of necessity, had to figure out how to make sure that we were uh, fully utilizing Harvard and we were fully digitally uh, transformed um, with our process. So, you know, without, without looking at data the right way, uh, without being able to have partners and platforms that we sit on top of, none of this would be possible. Um, less people would not have groceries, less people would not be able to do telemedicine, less people wouldn't be able to do COVID testing. And there's uh, case after case of, of, of other folks that we've helped out. So uh, pretty, pretty cool stuff. Yeah, no, that's amazing. I mean, it's, so it sounds like you were grappling with just explosive growth, both on the supply side and the demand side. Absolutely. Um, and, yeah. and, and you know, you look at, sorry, go for it, Daniel. No, no, no go ahead. Yeah, and you, you look at, you, look at um, you know, what's happened with, with COVID, um, and obviously that's, that's made everything exponentially harder. Um, and really what we've seen is just behaviors that are, 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 are not just magnified, but they're completely different than before. So it's not just 2,000 to 7,000, and you just do more of the same. Um, but you know, even last week, and I, I think people just saw the report that came out this morning on this, but even as of last week, 1.5 million people in America filed for unemployment for the first time, right? That's crazy if you think about that scale, 1.5 million people. And when you talk about who's being affected, 40% of people that make less than $40,000 um, are out of a job. That's that's terrible. And when you look at the fact that 60% of Americans are actually better off taking free money from the government um, with the CARES Act, Care Act and whatnot, you know, it creates a very interesting um, uh, situation for us. So you've got some people, honestly, that are literally applying for work just so that they can get their free money. So those are people you need to identify and move out quickly. You have a lot of people that are desperate just to find work to fill in for now, but the moment that the restaurant opens, maybe they go back. So being able to kind of think through who you want, how long you want them for, and be able to uh, automate that process is the only way for us to keep up. Um, so COVID has changed everything from, from the, the labor side and what they're looking for and the type of work opportunities people want, um, and, and, and being able to find the right people through a, a mass velocity system is more important than ever. Yeah, no, it, I mean, it's, it is a great point that it's not only that the scale, the volume that you're, of sort of your throughput has changed, but there are all kinds of new dynamics in terms of, you know, what kind of work people are looking for. People are having to change careers basically on a dime because the, you know, they worked in, in hospitality and all of a sudden restaurants are shut down. And so now they need to find something new. Um, yeah, that's, it's crazy. Um, you know, I, I do wonder sort of, as somebody who has perhaps felt the brunt of this uh, new hiring landscape more acutely than anybody else so far, I'm curious what what sort of advice you would have for other companies that are trying to navigate this this new rec or recruitment and hiring landscape. Yeah, I think I think uh, what what Greg had said earlier um, it was was spot on, um, and I think that you know number one is to to not feel inundated with the situation um, to believe that 
um, you actually could do more with less. And yes, your departments are spread thin. And yes, you probably lost folks because we all know HR and marketing are the two <laughs> departments that go first when 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 companies are contracting. Um, so you know, it's not it's not a fun time to be in your shoes for anybody who is in, in the HR department. But to believe that it is possible. Um, the other thing is to believe that actually very quickly you could throw up a system where you're where you're doing automation. So that that is a full integration from applications on your website the data collection on the side, using a platform to actually uh, figure and customize the questions, the behaviors, the profile of the worker that you want, load it up into the, into the system. For us, it's very, very seamless and easy to do, um, to, 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 to be able to use Google and Looker to optimize data along the way. Um, you know, it's very hard um, for folks in HR to even retrain interviews. Well, with, with a, a system like Looker and, and, and Harbor, you can do that instantaneously. So if you if you do find out that you need people that you know are better typers uh, or people that are better oral communicators or written communicators or problem solving, you can easily upload modules um, that test people's typing speeds or maybe math skills or analytical skills. All that is is done way faster than you could pull in your thirty recruiters and say, hey, from now on moving forward, starting on Monday you've got to start asking these questions. Like it would, it would be very, very long, laborious and intimidating to do it that way. So I think, I think there's hope. Um, I, I believe that uh, my advice would be to, you know, to quickly look at your options, uh, to quickly identify what, you know, the profile of the workers that you want, um, load it up into a system like a Harvard slash looker um, and, and really uh, unleash, but then make sure that you do have somebody on your team devoted to looking at the data. Um, because optimizing and reconfiguring and iterating is super important to the process. Yeah, I love that. I mean, and I do think it's a great point that, you know, the speed with which you can pivot, not just once, but continuously, that you can maintain that agility uh, as your needs change, because we know that this was not a single shift that, you know, we're now just adapting to a new, very stable world. This is a world that's constantly changing, and so businesses need to stay agile, and so having a digital digitally transformed system for your whole hiring process just gives you the ability to continue to um to maintain that agility and and change as as your needs change it's a great point i think um, advantage, oh yeah, agile, you know I, yeah i mean from a competitive advantage i think that you know, when people apply to your website this is what i've seen a lot of folks if people apply and they're waiting days or weeks to get a response back you know it's demoralizing it's defeating and honestly if somebody's a really good talent they're probably scooped up fast so when you're able to embed uh, uh, some of these technologies that Greg talked about, um, you're able to respond to people faster. Right? So if Daniel applies to NextRep's website, and if I get back to him within minutes or an hour, automatically, isn't that more impressive and more attractive than applying to another company and you hear back in two weeks, right? So I think there's, for smart companies now, I think you're actually going to find that's available, and they might have been and furloughed or laid off just because of the environment and situation and, and they're fantastic people and they're they're available I, so i would actually say there's a, a great gold mine of talent and if you're smart and you're fast and you are just that much better than everybody else you're actually going to find that this is an, a, an opportunity for you to enter 2021 with some really great talent that's going to transform your business so i would i would shift people's mindset to think about the opportunity that we have but again velocity data and doing things the right way um is is, is, is critical to that yeah, couldn't agree more. So I'm going to bring uh, Baron and, and Greg back in uh, and open it up to questions, just as a reminder to our participants, uh, our attendees. If you have a question, please just go ahead and write it in uh, in the Q&A bar, uh, and I will get started. We've already got a bunch coming in. So um, one question from Mara is, um, how AI automation and using multiple data points can measure applicant qualities like empathy, collaboration, and ability to motivate others. You know, given that these qualities are so fundamental in today's work environment, you know, ensuring that we hire people who will treat other employees fairly and with compassion is really important. So, Baron, do you want to? You're, you're nodding like you want to take this one. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we hear this a lot, of course, especially yeah, in these new days that things like empathy, especially in these days, are extremely important. The reality is also that these words mean different things in different companies. So what we normally do when we start with a new client, the people science team spends time in diving into what does it really mean for your organization. And yeah, then we have multiple assessments and, and modules to collect the data that's relevant. And I think one that 
yeah, would work for some of these um, yeah, competences or personality traits would be a situational judgment test where you would, an applicant in a scenarios, actually uh, yeah, let them do the job and see how they would respond in these real life uh, like scenarios. And um, yeah, by collecting those responses and answers, it's very well possible to build uh, data profiles around these topics. Nice. Um, that is pretty amazing stuff. Um, Greg, I think maybe this one would be good for you. So a uh, question about you know the insights that you're getting from the data and, and insight into your process. Is that live insight? You know, what is the latency like? You know, given today's world, the faster we have data in front of us, the better. So, you know, how quickly are people able to get these insights from the data? That's a really good and important question. So we're running replications in well under an hour. So um, while it isn't instantaneous when it comes to the display and analytics, uh, the replications are happening fast enough to where any specific data-driven trend or even a, a feed is pretty close to real time. That is very cool, and I think definitely goes to the point that I brought up at the very beginning, just that you know when your system is sort of integrated and you know, you've got something like Looker sitting on top of their database, the the need to sort of do those long ETLs that are often you know 24 hours or longer starts to go away and you can get maybe not to you know sub second latency, but certainly within an hour is is quite possible and I think really does, as the questioner pointed out, make a big difference in uh, in what's possible. Um, so I've got another question, and maybe Teddy, actually, this, this might be a good one for you. So the, the questioner said, you know, I can see this working in many industries, but like how applicable is this to the retail reality where applicants don't really like filling in an hour long assessment? You know, I'm curious what you've seen in terms of people's willingness to go through these assessments. You know, you're not in retail, but you're, you're working in sort of call center tech. I'm curious, you know, have you seen um, their willingness to do that be pretty high, and and also if there's been any correlations with you know people's success on the job. I, I think there's a lot of consistency between the folks that we get and folks that uh, are in retail. A lot of people that apply to us used to have retail, so I, I know exactly who that person is. These people actually prefer it uh, because with retail. Uh, you know, versus what we're doing. Number one, everybody's at home. So they actually don't have to drive to the mall. They don't have to drive to a store. Um, they are able to uh, to uh, do things on a more uh, quick uh, velocity. So, you know, so number one, they're saving time to commute. So whatever in, in, you know, in the hour. The second thing is if you do this right, and um, Rhonda actually had a really good video on this, which is it's incredibly interactive. So it doesn't feel like an hour. Um, there's parts of the hour that are just, explaining what the opportunity is. So um, I think you make it interactive. I think if uh, the questions are, and, and the questions are very easy to navigate and quickly the algorithms rhythms are running in the background to say, uh, you know, you're good for this, you're good for that. Um, but it, it really, a lot of that hour is actually giving information and it's very interactive and it, it fast. Um, and the other thing is uh, for a lot of folks um, who are in retail, you know, it might be their first job, you know, they're, they're very intimidated. Uh, when they actually show up, they don't know what to they don't know what to say. Um, and um, in, in this environment, you know, there is the ability for them to make sure they gather themselves and they answer, you know, truthfully. And, and they are who they they are who they are. So I think retail is a great uh, people in restaurants. People as that comes back up, retail. Uh, I think the way that this, this uh, system is designed is really meant for for that type of mass worker. Yeah, Daniel, can awesome. I add something to that? Yeah, yeah, um, absolutely. Yeah. Just quickly, I think when you look at retail, but also hospitality, these are often multi-location environments. And what we also see is that applicants tend to apply at the location closest to you. Um, what our system can do as well is look at what is the need in the different locations and literally route applicants between locations. So what we see, for example, with large grocery chains is that some locations have an overflow of applicants, Others have a shortage, and then our system automatically asks the applicant, are you willing to work in the other location? And if the answer is yes, then in a split second, the applicant is moved from one vacancy to the other. So matching technology is so much more. The other part is, um, you say an hour, but of course it doesn't have to be an hour. The digital experience needs to be tailored to the requirements of the job. So sometimes that's an hour, sometimes it's even more, and sometimes it's only 15 minutes, depending on the data that you need to collect, and the information you need to provide to come to a valid decision for both applicant and organization. 
Yeah, no, it's a great point. And I, I think actually that leads nicely into the next question that I was going to ask for uh, the folks from Harvard, which is just, you know, the questioner says, you know, I can see this working for younger types applying who are at the beginning of their career process. Um, they're wondering, you know, what about mid or senior level folks that are m used to a more human interaction driven recruitment process? In, in general, I think since the start of the internet, this was always the topic. And I think in general, also senior people are really familiar with the internet. You do online banking, you book your travels online, but there's another part that's interesting. A lot of all, also older people will be forced to move to new industries. If you have been working in a restaurant for 20 years, then yeah, maybe you need to move now to something completely different. And then these kind of experience can allow an applicant from home on the couch to slowly in his own pace discover what it means and then decide is this something uh, for me yes or no so i don't believe that age yeah plays a factor in whether a digital transformation is an option for an organization cool um the, the only thing that i would oh, add yeah, to that ahead. is that when it comes to insights um when we look at the experience of uh, people who are mid or late stage in their career, um, they are actually some of our largest raving fans in terms of candidate experience rating and predominantly complete the process on a tablet. Um, so there's a lot of interesting um, tidbits around uh, various uh, age perception um, and also experience perception on these types of processes. Um, but we see it really working quite well across the board. Nice. That, that, is a, that is a neat insight that they tend to be on tablets. Um, and actually, that leads nicely into, into the next question, which is, you know, besides the next rep case, which is awesome to hear, that's not me saying that, that's the questioner. Um, you know, Harvard, can you share anything around other metrics that you've seen improve across the board? Well, Greg, you're in the dashboard every day. You want to pick up this one? Yeah, sure. So uh, um, I think for the audience, it's important to know when you look at the examples, uh, both next rep and for the video that was played for Heineken, um, the solutions are very much so uh, developed based on the specific use case and the problems that the company has. That may be a big volume problem, but that also may be an attrition problem or the ability to actually improve the quality of hire. And when we design our solution, we go into the performance data uh, systems that the company has. We go into the current employees within the role. And using our psychometric batteries, we really identify the factors that differentiate high and low performance um, and marry that with the realistic job preview and the ability to flesh out, as um, you know, Teddy uh, mentioned, people who are really just not committed to the work and are just applying because they have to. So by combining all of those factors, we create this uh, silver bullet that in many cases is able to reduce 30-day attrition and 60-day attrition uh, in upwards of some clients up to 50%. Um, similarly, when it comes to KPI prediction or success in the role, um, we're able to also identify at an overall assessment level or even at a component level within the capabilities that we create for matching where someone's going to do really well but also where their potential points of deficiency are. And what companies do is use this not only for top of funnel selection, but they also use it as information to guide the development of the candidate and also to dynamically adjust the interview process to focus in on the points that really matter because they've been qualified on nine out of 10 things that they know are important. So they zero that conversation in on the one area where there might be a gap. Got it. Yeah, that's amazing stuff. Um, I, so uh, here's a question, um, Greg, maybe this, maybe this one's best for you, um, kind of meta. So the, the questioner is asking if you provide recommended action plans based on the insights that you're generating, and if you do, do you have data on how your users are taking action based on the data that they see? So data about how people are using your data. Well, it's in our nature to have dashboards on our dashboards. So um, I think the short answer to that question um, is yes. But when it comes to specifically at a, let's call it a candidate level and taking action, I think one of the, the easiest examples is the one that I just mentioned about identifying at the top of funnel using our matching, what is the best hiring DNA look like for this position? And then identifying the points of variance from perfection of that DNA and using that information to dynamically change the interview process. So what we do in coordination with our staff IO psychologists is develop 
star interview questions that correspond to all of the benchmark facets or competencies within a personality test so that when a deficiency is identified, the uh, recruiter or the hiring manager has a very specific question built to handle that very specific process and that very specific point of deficiency. So um, we, we wrap all of that in a SaaS solution um, so that they have the ability to take action. Uh, and then when those hiring decisions or outcomes are made, whether that be in our system or an adjacent platform like an ATS, through the APIs, we're identifying um, what happened with that candidate and, of course, displaying an analytics to see both individually and in aggregate if there are trends taking place or variances between what was matched, what the outcome was, and how an organization should respond to that. Very cool. Um, so since I know Harvard operates in multiple uh, localities, th this is a good question. You know, how, how do you deal with data around bias and context where you would not want to collect such data from applicants, you know, due to, for example, the equal treatment law in, in Germany or, you know, avoiding perceptions of discrimination, even if it's positive discrimination? Yeah, I think that's a, a very important, uh, important topic. I think when you set up a matching profile and you talk with clients about the data that you need to collect, I think this is one of the yeah, first questions to ask. One, is the data, first of all, predictive for success? And on the other hand, is the answer this, to this question cannot result to bias? So I think, yeah, the most obvious one we just showed is name, where the answer is yes. But it can also be education, what school that you want, your level of education. All these things can have impact on the, on the overall bias of the recruitment uh, industry. So I think, and that's not only us, but everybody, I think we should all challenge ourselves for each data point that we collect. Is it relevant? Is it needed? And can it create bias? And also when, yeah, we still define that it's a good question to ask, yeah, train models, but also train humans on how to interpret the data so you don't go yeah, sideways. Yeah, got it. Um, so I think we have time for one last question. Um, and actually, maybe it would be great to hear from Harvard's perspective and also from NextRap's perspective. So the question is, how do you avoid an applicant providing skewed answers to your evaluation process and gaming the system? Um, from Harvard's perspective, I think, how do you design a system to prevent gaming? And um, Teddy, you know, as somebody who's had to deal with this overwhelming flood of new applications, you know, how do you, how do you work with Harvard to design a, an application process that does a good job of weeding those folks out? Yeah, that's interesting. So people that try to basically cheat the system that provide fake answers, also in the platform, they, they are behaving in a different way. And that's, I think, where recruitment is lucky that we yeah, are maybe a little bit the laggards in innovation. We can leverage methodologies that, for example, are used in online banking to detect if people behave in the platform differently, flag them, and then later on check if there is, yeah, in the process, things that look awkward. On a more manual part, there is always the last stage where the applicant still can have an interview where you can double check the, yeah, the most critical elements and the answers that an, uh, that an applicant provided. So it's both a technical as a process effort to prevent this. Teddy, do you want to jump yeah, in? Yeah, for us, um, yeah, we, you know, the same, very similar. Uh, there's, there, we, we noticed outlier behaviors to questions and those are red flags. Uh, so that's number one. The second thing is that, um, you know, we still, we still ask, after we filter through the Harvard system, we actually still do um, uh, a human, um, you know, a human person to do the last finishing touches. So, uh, you know, we haven't completely away, but what we have able to, what we're able to do is generally have 92% of the people that are weeded out through Harvard, the 8% that we still talk to makes our life so so much easier. So, uh, so you know, it still it still is a combination of the AI. But I'm, I'm, you know, with Harbor, uh, the efficiency gains are just astronomical. Great. Um, well, we are at time. Uh, thank you to everybody for attending. Uh, thank you, Baron and Greg and Teddy. Uh, if you're interested in learning more, you can contact Harbor or NextRep uh, or check out Looker. Um, that brings today's webinar to a close. Just as a reminder, if you missed any part of this, don't worry. You will get a full recording in your inbox soon. Uh, thank you again for rolling with us with the technical difficulties at the beginning. Uh, and have a great day, everybody.